Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. As you all know, once in a while, I'd like to welcome guest hosts to the show to provide space for other wonderful and curious scholars and readers to talk to guests of their choosing. A past guest of mine from episode 176, Dr. Arlene Sanchez Walsh, has a longtime interest in broadcasting and over the last several months has brought several amazing episodes to the podcast in episodes with Dr. Felipe Hinojosa, Dr. Christy Navin Warren, Dr. Brett Hendrickson, and Dr. Joao Chavez. Dr. Sanchez Walsh is back on this episode in conversation with Dr. Jennifer Koshatka Seaman, author of Borderlands Curanderos, The Worlds of Santa Teresa Orea and Don Pedrito Jaramillo. It is such a thrill for me to welcome Dr. Sanchez Walsh back on the show as host, and I love bringing you these guest-hosted episodes, so I hope that you really enjoy the conversation. Thanks for listening. Hello, this is your guest host, Dr. Arlene Sanchez-Walsh. Stepping in for Greg Soden, the intrepid founder of the Classical Ideas podcast. Today, wow, what a treat. Uh, Talking Borderlands Coranderos with Dr. Jennifer Koshatka Seaman, lecturer in history at Metropolitan State University in Denver. Her new book is Borderlands Coranderos, The Worlds of Santa Teresa Urea and Don Pedrito Jaramillo, published by University of Texas Press. Okay, Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Arlene. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm super excited to discuss Borderlands Corenderos with you. Fantastic, fantastic. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let me start by saying what I just told you off the air is that I really wanted to do this for my dissertation. Uh, maybe many, many years ago, I probably should have, um, but this is fascinating. So tell me why you wanted to do this. Yes, so I really kind of, um, in a way, sort of stumbled upon this topic. I um, have, um, so I am not Latinx, and I grew up Catholic. I grew up sort of Irish Catholic, is what my mom is, and and so I'm so familiar with um, so that that small piece of Guanderismo. Um, but when I started graduate school, I um, at S Southern Methodist University, I didn't have a topic in mind. And that program focused on like borderlands history, Southwestern history. So all of my cohort kind of knew what they were doing and I really didn't. Um, but I also worked at a bookstore um, in this fantastic bookstore in Denton, Texas, which I got to give a call out to um, Recycled Books. Um, it's in this old opera house. And anyway, I, I worked there part-time when I was in graduate school intermittently mm-hmm in the history section in the basement and especially in the Texana section. Um, so those Texans are familiar with this idea like Texana is often sort of Texas history, but also, you know, folklore, myth and that sort of thing. But anyway, I came across this book called Teresita um, by William Curry Holden. In fact, one of my colleagues at, at Recycled gave it to me because he knew that I was um, interested in just um, his women in history, but I'm also interested in the history of religion and, um, and indigenous peoples. And he's like, Jenny, I think you're going to love this book. It's, it's, um, you know, it's about this curandera. And I'm like, what is a curandera? And so anyway, so Teresita by William Curry Holden published in the 1970s is what, you know, historians call a hagiography. It's, um, you know, it's sort of like a novelization of her life. And it's, you know, it's, um, you know, he, there's dialogue in it that uh, the author inserts, but Holden did incredible research um, on this topic. So, and anyway, so I was reading this book and got really, really interested in, in Teresita. Um, and I started to Google and search for more about her. And as I was starting graduate school, um, David Weber, um, uh, now deceased historian of, of the Southwestern borderlands was my advisor when I first started. Um, and he was like, Jenny, what are you gonna do? And I was like, you know, I, I'm not really sure, but I'm reading this really fascinating book um, about this curandera and, and, and I'm reading these other things that I'm picking up along the way. And he's like, you know what? do your seminar paper on that. And so that's kind of, that. that's really how it started for me. And obviously I found that there's significant things, wonderful things written about uh, Teresa Urea novels and, you know, uh, um, seminar papers and, um, and, and articles and books, you know, that she has a part in. So I kind of found everything 
about her. And then as I was searching for, um, you know, certain re researching curanderismo more broadly, I came across, of course, Don Pedrito Jaramillo. Um, and, and then in a different graduate school seminar, and I, the idea was presented to me, well, why don't you see if you can think about doing sort of a, like looking at both of their lives sort of in tandem, because they lived approximately at the same time, both well-known healers, Teresita more so than Don Pedrito, but in his region very much, he's is kind of as much as a celebrity as she is. And so that's for me, that's what led me to it. And I just, you know, I'm also um, growing up in a somewhat religious family, again, Catholic, but also part of my family became more sort of born again Christian. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I experienced laying out of hands healing in that kind of Protestant faith healing tradition. Um, and that's always something that's really interested me um, and just different kind of ideas about um, belief, why people believe what they believe. And then of course, spiritual healing. So this topic just kind of, it just, all of those things really were just really fascinating to me. And I just really wanted to learn more at first. So that's, yeah, my long-winded. Um, oh, that's fine. No, 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 that's that's wow. great. Thank you, thank you. You know, one of the main points of this very fine book, and it really is, and, and I guess I'm a historian, you're a historian, and people just don't, uh, I wouldn't say average folk who've never set foot in archives or never had to dig around for stuff and, and look for things, don't realize how awesome it is to find this stuff to, to, to ply it through, to kind of look through it, to sift through it, all these papers and things that you managed to grab together, really, really, truly just good stuff, really, really good stuff. And one of the points that you make is that uh, these folks, they're not just healers, mm -hmm. Urea and uh, Jaramillo, that they're political leaders in a way, uh, that they provide a lot more than healing. Uh, and I know there's a lot in the book that talks about that. Can you pick out maybe uh, a story or two that tell us about how Teresita and Pedrito serve these roles? Yes, thank you, Arlene. That's a great question. And, and interestingly, that I first wanted to call the book The Politics of Curanderismo for, for that very reason. And then, yes, yeah, yeah. so I, and, I, and when I was thinking about the title, I had a student, my students at, at Metro Center were like, oh, we love that title, but we went with a different title. But anyway, I, but, but, but yes, yeah, so right, the politics of healing, the politics of curanderismo. So one example um, from Teres Urrea, there are so many, but I'm gonna use one that I use in the yeah. first chapter of the book. Um, so she, there's this rebellion, there's this border rebellion in 1896. Um, so those um, listeners familiar with the Mexican revolution kind of probably know, you know, 1910 is the Mexican revolution. Uh, and a lot of it took place in kind of Northern Mexico, the border region, but you know, even a decade or so before the rebellion breaks out, there are, there's resistance to the, the regime of Porfirio Diaz in Mexico. So, um, so I sort of situate her in that pre-revolutionary Mexico borderlands region, particularly because in 1896, um, what comes to be known as the Teresista uprising or the Teresista rebellion is when a group of, um, you know, probably Yaqui, so Yaqui are an indigenous people in Northwestern Mexico um, from this kind of Sonora, Sinaloa region, um, long history of uh, resistance to both the Spanish and the Mexican government, um, but mm -hmm. also many of them were adherents of Teresita, that's the region she was from, and she healed them. So this so this, this border uprising in 1896 had to do, you know, the story goes that there's a group of Mex Mexicanos and Yaquis, um, they wanted to overthrow the government of Porfirio Diaz by um, getting guns possibly from Teresita, an inspiration, more significantly, you know, spiritual inspiration and blessing from her, staging the rebellion from Nogales, Arizona territory. Um, Arizona was a territory in 1896, not yet a state, and then, and then attacking the customs house in Nogales, Sonora, just right across the border. And this, you know, the idea was the customs house is the place where the guns are and the money, and from there would be a broader rebellion and overthrow of the government. It was in my research, right, this is often very dismissed um, in, in some research, not all, but, but in a lot of it is sort of that it's failed, right? I mean, the revolution doesn't happen in 1896. Mm -hmm. um, the, both the, um, the government of Mexico, um, the state, local government, Sonora and that region and U.S. officials um, and vigilantes put down this rebellion, um, in, take pictures of the, of the murdered um, Yaqui rebels um, with mm -hmm. lots of them with around their neck, a picture of Teresita. 
um, and letters on their bodies, right, of the, that they believed were from Teresita. And when I did research in Mexico City in the archive, this is this is what a ton of the stuff was about. Um, the like, you know, the, the yeah, right, so amazing, you know, interviews with the survivors of this. Um, and so, so here's a place where Teresita is very much a part of a political rebellion. Um, but what was so interesting about this is that, you know, you, if you read the archives or you read the kind of reports um, from the Mexican government, they'll say things like she's, these, these, um, these rebels are just ignorant, you know, these are the words that they would use, ignorant savages, right? Because they're indigenous people, they're fanatics, they're Catholics. She's just manipulating them, right? Or they just, you know, or that that's one narrative. Um, or her, fa her father, so Teresita's father, Tomas Urea, was very much an anti porfir He was an anti porfirista <laughs> anti-Diaz. Um, he was part of the liberal clubs that were going around Mexico at that time. So mm -hmm. she was very much a part of a world of, you know, political activism. But, you know, so, so they would say, oh, she, her father's just, she's just being used. She doesn't know what she's doing. She's just a girl, 19, 20 years old. Um, right, right, right. But, but when she, when, when you read her words and when she, you know, that, which is what I want to do. I wanted to find as many of her words as I could, which is hard. You know, you guys have yeah. to switch on this topic. It, um, she was incredibly passionate and smart and eloquent about what she believed, what were the evils, were the, you know, um, the wrongs of the, the Diaz government against indigenous peoples, um, even though out of one side of her mouth, she would say, I have nothing to do with this uprising. But yet on the other side of her mouth, she would say, what is this government, this government who kills and lynches indigenous people? So, yeah. So here she is as a healer, you know, she has her power and her inspiration mm -hmm. for these communities of these, these rebels, right? Yeah. Um, because yeah. she heals them, but also she is, she is engaged in the politics of the time. She doesn't live outside of it. She's not just a, you know, um, you know, she's not just someone who's being used or, you know, all those kind of tropes, um, you know, so that's, I mean, for me, that's one of the big, one of the big uh, pieces of her political activism, but there's so many, Arlene, as you know, from the book. I know, I know, and yeah. Even in LA where you're, from, you know, in Southern California. So I know I want to move to Don Pedrito, but you know, there's this, in, so many years later or several years later, she had a short life. She died at 33. So, um, yeah. so in 1903, there's a strike among, um, there's a, a, um, the uh, a Mexican union of track workers, trackeros is formed in LA. Mm -hmm. And they strike um, for higher wages um, right around the time there's this like Fiesta Days parade and Teddy Roosevelt is coming. And she is supposedly right in some of the articles that I saw in the, in the L.A. Times and other papers. She is like uh, uh, leading women um, down the streets like to like take the, the scabs right that are that are working that are not. Mm -hmm. So she's also a part of this kind of labor activism, you know, which is talking about all the many things I wish I had more time to dig into more deeply. So just as a little side note, her political activism, I think, is as important as her healing, but they're both important and they're they're intertwined. So um, so, yeah, so, sure, yeah. Sure, yeah. so she's very explicitly, I would say political and, and and in that very certain specific political context of the borderlands and then of course later when she goes to LA as I described in the, the labor strike there yeah um, Don Pedrito there's not as many words from Don Pedrito so for him so how I so I would, so one of the political kind of situations that I, I I would say the way that he's political is when and I think it's 18 gosh I've got my book right here I need to 1894 90 around the same time 1894, 1896, there's a drought in Texas and it's really bad. Um, and um, the state is giving out rations of corn and other things to these communities that are really struggling. And so where Don Pedrito is situated in the, the, the Rio Grande Valley, like the South Texas Rio Grande Valley region, um, where his kind of healing is situated, um, the state of Texas uses him, his, his rancho, Los Olmos, so small, and if any any of the listeners have ever been to this region, where his rancho was, there's a shrine now, and it's it's still very very. There's not not too much around it, right? Um, but the state, but because of his um, reputation as this amazing healer, they knew about him, 
And so, um, and so, so that's like this, there's this map that um, Homero Vera, who is a kind of a local historian, a wonderful friend and man um, in, in South Texas. And he, um, he shared it with me years ago at a history conference. He's like, Jenny, you've got to see this map. Look at this map from 1890, it was 1890, maybe 1892. I have it in the book. There's, you know, all these you know, bigger cities like San Antonio and, and Corpus Christi, but the roads, there's tons of roads going into Los Olmos. And it's just- Saw that in the book. That was yeah. fascinating. That was really something. I know. All roads lead to this, right? Like that all roads idea that leading to this. And you mentioned it later in the book, not to interrupt when you had to finish your story, but the pilgrimage, right? It's kind of like making, making paths of pathways for pilgrimage for people seeking him out in this small little space, which is really something. Yes, yes, Arlene, no, and I, that was like a moment of, that was such a, Homero sharing that with me and, and, and like showing me that, pointing it out to me, um, and as someone that's not from that region, so mm -hmm. I, it's like, again, one of those things, like, I've been so very, very lucky and um, blessed <laughs> to use a spiritual mm -hmm. term, but people that have helped me, that have shared things with right. me, there's no, no, no way I, this book would ever be produced, not just without my wonderful, you know, scholarly advisors from SMU and others that yep. have shared with me, but from the people of these communities who have let me, who have, you know, been so, so helpful. So yeah, so this, so this map shows, this 1892 map of, you know, Texas shows all these roads going into Los Olmos, and it's really just a ranch. It's a, and so what it shows, right, is that these people are going there, people know about this place, and then you have the government, the state government, um, using, trying to figure out how to distribute rations to a, a, a population really struggling. And so you yeah. they use this curandero. He's not an official, he's not even an official doctor. He just, you know, but here he is this kind of glue in a way that really is holding together. I'm, I think I could, we could argue um, various strands of this community because of his healing. And so I yeah. think that's a yeah. kind of political action, like a, a Right where it's it's through him that these beans and corn and these other uh, other um, state rations are distributed through the community because Don Pedro is already doing that. He's already mm -hmm. taking the people that have that he's healed that have had money like the the Canales family um, that have gifted him and there's other you know kind of wealthy Tejanos and others that have gifted him you know land and other things. Um, you know, really pretty um, significant gifts because of his healing, but mostly Don Pedrito never takes anything according to the sources. Um, he, you know, there's no, there's no price attached to his healing. But when he does get something, as all of my, um, the sources say, he puts it back into the community. Um, so that's a kind of politics, I think, of, of sure. community. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that, those, those are great, great stories uh i don't know as much about him and i guess that, that is the, yeah. the fault of those of us who follow the historiography of curanderismo uh he's there but he's he's so localized right, right. in texas it's just you know but yes. great great stuff uh, i do want to stick with teresita for a bit and then sure. if we can weave our way towards espiritismo we can it's a complicated discussion yeah. which is why i want to kind of skip over that i have it in my notes but okay. teresita for a little bit just because I was fascinated by the story. You mentioned that she took up a habit of eating dirt, um, which I believe is a medical condition. Uh, I think it's called pica. I mean, uh -huh. I think it's because of deficiency. It's mm -hmm. nutritional deficiency, right? And so I think it's a legitimate medical issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was reported that that's all she ate, right? Mm -hmm. it was this eating dirt and that, that gave her some kind of healing powers. And it, it brought to mind you being a, a, or having an Irish Catholic background, uh, many Catholic saints would uh, they they lived solely on communion hosts for years i don't remember what the proper term for that is it's a term there's an actual term for it that's fascinating to me yes i mean that is so interesting so um it's very i mean it, it just says a lot that there's like these fine threads about what's what gives you power obviously in a catholic context it would have to be a communion host right it would have to be something that's codified that's that's okay with the hierarchy and that's not gonna to cause too much trouble. But then you have this woman who's eating dirt, which is a legitimate medical condition, but that's giving her power. That certainly is outside the bounds of uh, Catholic orthodoxy, right? But it's giving her these great powers, right? I mean, what did you think of that when you read that? That, that, that was just a great story for me. 
Oh, Arlene, thank you for that question. No, I haven't. I've, you know, I've given a, a talk to a couple of people in different classes and that question has not come up. And I'm so glad you asked it because it's one of the things that I really struck me as well. And I spent a lot of time with it. And just as you're posing the question now, just the thing that I, I think I'm thinking of, um, just, you know, just a response to it is when you think of like the communion host, um, it comes from God, it comes from heaven. It's this kind of, you know, it's official, it's kept in the tabernacle and you better not be a bad Catholic and get, go behind the tabernacle. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's this thing, but it's, it's like very much this up here from God blessed. Uh, and, and here she's taking dirt from the ground, from the earth. And that's in a way, this kind of sacred or, or you know, I don't want to put words, obviously words into Tedesita's mouth, but I haven't read, but I think just based on what you're saying, it is this kind of, it, it, it's not only the way that she heals herself when she has this, her dawn experience or her like, you know, um, this yeah. period when she's young and she goes into this kind of trance state and she has, you know, I mean, like sort of seizures, um, you know, that, that, this, that whole period is really interesting and fascinating and where, and, you know, it seems to be the time when she realized or this gift of healing came to her or the dawn of healing. But um, as I was researching it and the different stories and the different witnesses accounts of this that that came up that 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 she ate dirt that she would only drink water or eat dirt for how I forget how forever many days and then when she would heal she healed herself um by by you know by 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 dirt by dirt from Cabora dirt from the earth dirt from Mexico um, and she would use dirt to heal then other people as well um and which was one of the things that she you know sometimes with her own saliva. Um, yeah, I yeah, yeah. I read, but I think, but I, I love that, that, um, I love that question, Arlene, and just thinking about the way that it's this, like the sacred and the profane and, or the sacred and the, sure. ordinary, That's right. the ordinary, yeah. the heavenly and the earth like that. But yet there's not a real line between them for her. And I think maybe no. even for the Quindarismo practice, there's this kind of fluidity between those things. So, um, but yeah, I think I think that's a I don't mean to interrupt you, but it just no. strikes me now, like um, if you've looked at Brett Hendrickson's work on oh, yes, yes. where he talks about nature. Yeah. Right. And then this is kind of like a curanderismo as a as a whole. It's kind of a, it comes out of that natural, you know, because that's all you have before you have allopathic Western medicine. Right. And, and your your discussion about that and homeopathy. Great stuff. We'll get to that. But it's that whole idea that this is natural. You know, so there is no uh, profanity about eating dirt. It's right. unusual, right? But it's yeah. from the earth, right? And it sustains her, right? And it's so interesting that uh, that it's not viewed as a, as a as an odd thing. Um, you know, she heals with mud and saliva because it's again, it's a biblical, right? For those who are interested in in that. That right. narrative that that the healing of the eyes, you know, it wasn't Jesus, the healing of the eyes yeah. with mud or something like that, right? And <laughs> um, it's right, just like fascinating. That. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I, I just thought that was great. Um, talk about Catholicism for a little bit. How compatible was uh, Catholicism to Teresita's healing? Was there a lot of conflict that you found? Um, did it matter to her? Did it matter to her audience? Did the church have anything to say about her? Great questions. And so that's, you know, one of the things that I, um, so, so she was, she got into a lot of trouble with the church. So Teresita stories. No. <laughs> <Such joking. laughs> I mean, you know, when you're saying things like to your, to the people that come to, to be healed by her, when she would give these kind of sermons, I guess, or these kind of, um, which is quoted as saying things like, you don't have to go to priests to confess your sins. And I mean, she, and I, and at and some point, I think I quote, I think I quote in the book where she talks about the priests being, I mean, worse than the atheist. I think she said, says something like, I think God loves the atheist who, um, who, you know, loves his neighbors or does good or actually does good than the priest who, you know, basically is hypocritical. So she's extremely very, she's very critical of the Catholic Church as an institution and as priests. And so she, this very much gets her on the, the wrong side of the Catholic Church in Mexico. So just on an institutional or political level, um, you know, the kind of context, the historical context, again, for Teresita's world, and especially in Mexico is this kind of um, anti-Diaz. So there's a lot of um, 
uh, of uh, people who are against the, uh, the, the Diaz, the, 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 the government of Porfirio Diaz, who's the president of Mexico for like almost 30 years. <laughs> and he yeah, rules- a long time. Long time, he's a bit of an authoritarian. Um, he is, uh, he is, um, yeah. You know, and so she, and so she, again, her, so she's her father, but at herself, you know, they're very much a part of the, the anti-Diaz or the liberals who are also, you know, against Diaz and the corruption of his regime and the kind of authoritarianism and quite honestly, just the straight up violence of, of, of his regime and um, very t- scary um, to speak out against him. Obviously she's kicked out of Mexico because she does, but, but also a part of that anti-Diaz, um, a world that she's in is anti-clericalism or the anti-Catholic church. It's kind of like, so all that's this kind of corrupted regime is part of this corrupted Catholic church where, you know, um, they're kind of sort of, you know, not to be crass, but sort of in bed together. So, so sure. she's yeah. certainly, right. So there's that political part of it. And then of course, she's just, you know, as, as you were talking about, she's actually saying things to people that you don't have to go to a priest to confess your sins. Or I mm. think she was known to baptize babies. That's right. That's right. Um, perform basically liturgies, um, you know, the, uh, and Paul, yeah. uh, Paul Vanderwood, um, The Power of God Against the Guns of Government, the historian Paul Vanderwood wrote this amazing um, history of the Tomochic Rebellion, which is in, mm-hmm. took place in Chihuahua in Mexico in this mountain community where they had taken on Teresita as sort of their saint. Um, and that got, and so in the, although she by all accounts never went there, but people from that community had been to Cabora where she was healing and taken inspiration from her. So she was all mix, mixed up and on the wrong side of the church. And, but the other thing is, Arlene, that you say that I was just at the um, at the American Society of Church History um, annual meeting in New Orleans a couple of a month ago and on a panel and I t- did, gave a paper that I wanting to, so she was, so I came across court, uh, sources that said that um, in El Paso, the Catholic church there told their parishioners that if they, when she was living in El Paso, which she did for just about a year, 1896, that if they went to see Teresita to get healed by her, that they would be excommunicated, not welcome back in the church. So- It's not surprising at all. That's right, it's not surprising at all. So, so right, so here she's, but, but here's the thing, people I'm sure many, and I, and you know, many of her adherents would not went to see her, believed in her, but also went to church on Sunday and believed in the church as well. You know, so I think there's- Of course. Yeah. Of course, and even more so with Don Pedrito, you see where like he was, you know, because he wasn't an outspoken anti-clericalist. I think it was more mm-hmm. like the priest was like, "Yeah, you can go see the Quran. They don't know big deal. It's fine." Right. You know? right. But of course, for right. her, you know, she's a heretic. She's, you know, profaning the church in all these ways. So yeah, she's definitely on, you know, antagonistic with the Catholic Church for sure. Okay. All right. She goes to San Francisco and L.A. So of course, those are my. That's my backyard. Um, and then we talked uh, off off the air uh, that I'd really love to write a history, a religious history of LA through the lenses of alternative religious folks, because it turn of the century was just wild here. It was just crazy, and I love it. I love stuff like that. That's why I got into this business. Um, and so these cities are filled with Protestants, and some of whom uh, also claim to heal. Um, mm-hmm. Are there, do you have any idea if Teresita and Christian faith healers cross paths? Um, I did not find any evidence of that, but Arlene, I would be surprised if she didn't. Um, that's, I, I would be absolutely surprised because she was, you know, she was performing on stages, you know, as other mm-hmm. kinds of faith healers did. Um, and, um, and so she was kind of, she was part of that world of kind of performance of the exotic other or of the faith healers or that kind of whole thing. So I didn't, the, the only kind of cross, you know, the, the, the connections between other, uh, pra, you know, uh, faith practices were like spiritualists. I mean, she was an avowed espiritista. So she, you know, yeah, yeah. claimed that. But so spiritualists, so the, you know, the, some of the traces I found, and this is another one of those little threads that I, you know, given more time, time's always a thing doing research, if I could follow up on, that there was this, apparently these spiritualists or women that, you know, uh, advertised in the papers as spiritualists. Um, and I did a little bit of research I did, I found that one of these women that apparent that, that um, I know helped Teresita get out of this contract she was in with this promoter um, that was a 
exploiting her. Right? That There's was fascinating. Yes. That was great. What and a great story. I love that story. Like that story is so great. Women helping her, these spirit. And one was for uh, Madam Young, what's her name? Was yeah. this kind of, it seems like a prominent, at least in San Francisco, uh, spiritualist um, clairvoyant or healer helped her get out of this contract, probably helping her like with translations and things like that. Um, so she definitely, so clearly she was an espiritista. And I know that spiritualists in the United States and espiritistas in Mexico and other places in Latin America had a lot of shared, you know, newspaper articles and cross pollination and things like that. So right. definitely that connection is there. And, and even that one, gosh, I would love to just research it even more. But in terms of other kinds of faith healers, again, I didn't, nothing popped out, out to me that I saw, but I, I, I would, you know, almost put money on it that there had to have been you know, they had to have at least known of each other. Oh, without question. I, I don't, because these are small towns. Uh, San Francisco, probably bigger, right? But LA is small, turn small. of the century, tiny, you know? And so also where these Protestant, uh, mostly uh, holiness of Pentecostals, my folks are uh, there right on the edge of downtown, Sonora town in right. Royal Heights, where she is. And um, in the early, early, uh, formation of these Pentecostal missions to Mexicanos, Me Mexican workers, migrant workers. Um, uh, these are um, Anglo Pentecostals, obviously, and they're writing. And one of the, you know, amongst the many, many things that you cannot be, <laughs> right? So you can't be Catholic, you can't be Mormon, you can't be, you can't be anything aside from Pentecostal. But one of the things in there you cannot be is a spiritualist. Right. And see, by, by the beginning of the 20th century, especially in the in the West Coast, I don't know if that was a big deal. Right. If it was a hot topic or if it was directly related or maybe indirectly related to this kind of activity. Right. Or it's like, where did you get that idea from that you could be healed, that, the, that somebody's channeling these. But that's just demonic. You know, the way that they would have put it back then, you know, right, or right. to this day, the way they put it to this day. Right. So that to me was fascinating that there's all this interesting interworking. Um, I, I have never found her name specifically in any Pentecostal magazine uh, that says that you should not go here. Unfortunately, as you know, so much of the the Spanish language papers of that time, uh, Pentecostal papers, Protestant papers, they're not around. They nobody bothered to archive these things, no, no. right? So they're like, you can only guess that you, you know, you, you suppose it's a good guess that that's something that they knew of her because she was so popular and that they did not like her. <laughs> that and would then, be my guess. And so, when was and I, I know that the Azusa Street revival was 1906. 1906 like she, so, she leaves. I mean, that's just, I. Your this this question is actually it's then that this has come up um in, like in earlier when I was talking to other folks doing research maybe it was even with Brett Hendrickson you know but um okay. about like and you know like Jen like 1906 like that's like she's that's just a couple of years after she's there and as we know religious movements don't just all of a sudden happen one year and then no. you know there's the season exactly. is like, and then so and I so that's just again I, I again why I feel like this topic like her life it's just I I can't wait for. The other and as and it's already brewing other ideas you know I think that your idea is so I, I hope you you do that Arlene because but that's the other thing it brings up to me is something I was talking with my students about earlier today which is that you know how we know about the past is based upon the what what, what records are there and just because some records aren't there our archives aren't there doesn't mean those people weren't there or that they weren't important or they weren't doing that's anything. right but, and so, right. you know, so we always talk about like, how do we find these other voices? It's difficult. It's challenging. Um, it, it's easier to go with what you can find. Not that that's easy, but you know, um, yeah. So. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we could get to the spiritism, spiritualism question. I had it up there a little bit, but uh, I'll try and modify it for, uh, okay. for us. Um, oh, by the way, I am talking to Dr. Jennifer Kushatka Seaman. Her new book is Borderlands Coranderos, The Worlds of Santa Teresa Urea and Don Pedrito Jaramillo, published by University of Texas Press. And it is great, great stuff. Thank you. Um, 
spiritism, spiritualism, very complicated. So we don't have to get into the weeds because it's, yeah. I don't, I'm not even sure I get it. <laughs> I mean, and I've, oh. and, you know, we've both looked at it for years and it's like, it's still very, it's very convoluted, right? And there's a lot okay. of strands, right? Yes. And I don't mean to be pejorative. It's just, there's a lot of strands and you got to tease it out and it's difficult. Uh-huh. You know, it's, it's really, it's amazing. And then spiritism in Latin America is very different and the Caribbean and Mexico, it's very different. Mm-hmm. The, the influence of Kardec, um, right. it's, it's amazing how influential he was, right? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's stunning to me. And I guess another bucket list project I have is to trace that. I mean, wow. to trace spiritism through Latin American communities, right? Because it's, it's pretty amazing how influential yes. his philosophy was. I, I mean, know. I agree with you. That project is yes, like you, this French guy with what is just, yes, a very <laughs> wild <laughs> philosophy. Is, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. Um, but if you can, uh, you have these two systems operating in this healing universe on the border, right? Um, and there's this great section where you mentioned Teresita, and I believe he's a former Mexican politician, uh, Francisco Madero, and they thought that the Mexican nation could be healed through Espiritismo. Um, tell us about that. That that just blew my mind when I read that. Yes, yes. So, well, this was a really fun thing to to research. But as you say, also, you know, it, the lots of strands, and I'll then following those strands. But so I, so I, so. Um, so Francisco Madero is um, like kind of the first president after the Mexican Revolution. So, so that, back to that kind of revolutionary context in Mexico, sure. um, and and he's you know so very elite, um, famous, comes from incredibly wealthy family, um, and um, so you know he's mostly known um, you know as this as this political um, figure, uh, obviously really important political figure. Um, uh, it, in the Mexican early early phase of the Mexican Revolution, um, and so I found out. So I, as I was researching more about Teresita, and I was trying to follow the thread, um, which really came from her words, and then also from you know um, one um, scholar like very generously shared with me all of these um, scans she had of La, La Ilustración Espírita, the Illuminated Spirit, which was like the, a magazine or like a periodical of Espiritista uh, circles in in Mexico. In, in like 1890 or 1889, 19, 18, 1892, short span, but tons and tons of stuff they published. So yeah. I was pouring through these, translating these, trying to you know, finding all the references to Teresita and just finding out, oh my gosh, she's really in this. This is, yeah. she, this is yeah. what she's identifying with. And then of course I'm reading more and um, uh, it's um, uh, the, the scholar um, Teresa, I think Teresa Schrader, um, uh, uh, Schrader is her last name. I'm sorry, right now, I, but she's an um, incredible dissertation she wrote about Espiritismo, basically the, his, the kind of revolutionary Espiritistas in Mexico. Mm-hmm. And so she touches a little bit on, on Teresita. So, so I'm so I'm doing all this you know, secondary literature, looking at these these writings from Espiritistas who have. Um, identified Teresa Urrea, this young mestiza girl, um, healing people. She's, you know, Corendera. Her followers call her Corendera, a Santa, but they come and, you know, visit and they assess her and say, no, she's an espiritista medium. She's a gifted, gifted, gifted medium. And, yeah. um, but she, Teresa herself will, will claim this identity is the one that she believes is the truest faith. Um, so, so yeah, so she's, so she's engaged in being an espiritista, but not, not, she's not um, denigrating the people that follow her that probably wouldn't be espiritistas, at least in Mexico, at least the circles that were following her at this time were pretty middle, upper middle class, um, yeah. uh, kind of upper middle class liberals. And so they really kind of looked down their nose at indigenous peoples and Catholics and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm reading about like, what is the healing like? So it's, so if we think about curandismo as like dirt, and the, and, and the earth, this earth-based practice, we were talking about nature and, yeah. and, and the elements, you know, spiritismo is, it's, you know, you're, you're channeling energy, you're channeling kind of vibrations or electric yeah. currents through your mind and your hand. So it's very much not seen, right? It's kind of very different. Um, and, um, and so, you know, she's believed to be, so they claim that that's what she's doing when she's healing. Um, and so, um, so, 
So and, and th there's that piece of, for her, what Espiritismo is, but uh, Espiritistas were also some of the more radical ones, like her father and some of her father's friends were also um, believed that um, it kind of conflated the practice of Espiritismo, the religion of it, with the kind of political agenda they had it, and claimed that this was the thing, Espiritismo was the thing that would take Mexico out of the kind of oppression that they'd been in under the Porfiriato, under the Diaz regime, mm -hmm. and all of the inequality that defined Mexico, class inequality, and that Espiritismo would be the thing that you could elevate yourself to, and that Teresa Urea, as an espiritista was that person they called her the mexican joan of arc that could elevate right, right. that was great so that's great and so you, you when i first read these th read these things arlene you know you as you're doing research at first you're like i know what's happening here you know what am i reading and who are these people and then then i came across a um an, a scholar and i'm um, jethro hernandez um and he wrote about homeopathy um, and I'm not sure if his book is out yet. I should know that. But he shared with me his dissertation. Um, and mm -hmm. he has a piece, he had a section on um, Francisco Madero. And, and mm -hmm. so, and the, at, at that Francisco Madero, who, you know, again, came from this incredibly wealthy family, a big asandado, but he was known for taking good care of the people that worked for him. Um, and he practiced homeopathic medicine, which was also kind of taking root um, in Mexico at this time and, and in the United States as it had before. But he also practiced espiritismo, um, and he believed uh, to to or as a scholars have written about that note that write about this that he channeled his brother. He had a brother that died in a fire, and so um, so some of uh, Madero's writings will talk about how you know, he has these spirit tra transmissions from his brother, saying you know that Mexico has to purify itself, it has to you know um, elevate itself to this higher level. So I wanted to pair these two people. Here's this woman. Tennessee Dulray, this young woman who's denigrated in so many or marginalized in sources or den and you know, here's Francisco Madero. I mean, he's like an icon, right? And I want to say, hey, sure. they're both saying the same thing, right? That like, like right. she's she is a part of this thing. And so, and 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 just how fascinating that people in this time, you know, with this turn of the century period, many people genuinely believed in these things and, and as 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 um, you know, we might call them fringe kind of belief systems today, but they were legitimate ways of understanding the world and thinking of making the world a better place, not just their own bodies and others, but actually the, the nation could get better by, sure. yeah. So Absolutely. I think uh, uh, American, you know, uh, Anglo um, spiritualists had that same thing in mind. Yes. Right. I mean, as, as a way to, right. to for social reform. You yes. know, um, uh, uh, during the Civil War, things of that nature. I mean, I've uh, yeah. that's not my field, but I mean, I've yeah, right. walked around those areas enough to go, yeah, I remember that from grad school. I remember that from Ann Browdy, and I remember yes. that from those folks. Like, She's right, that's the one. Okay, yeah. so right, right. I mean, you know, we're talking yeah. about a long time ago, but I, I remember that kind of uh, the interweaving of spiritualism and social reform and political reform and, and as like progressives who have, who are basically done with mainstream religion, especially women who don't have a, a way right. into a lot of these corridors of power going, this is where we get power. And I think you wrote that in the book as well, right? With Teresa, this is where she gets power. She gets power by claiming that and, and affirming her, her espiritismo. See, yes, absolutely. And, and I think that that's, that's the thing. That was the connection I made in when I was doing my research and reading Anne Browde, um, Radical Spirits. And I think it's Molly McGarry, another book, mm -hmm. one of either in, yeah. in Anne Browde's book or McGarry's book, they talk about like the spiritist seance tables, which is another way to channel the spirits. And sure. here, but like, you know, people like, I believe now I, I, you know, again, I'm not an expert in this, but I remember, I think that was Sojourner Truth and maybe even Frederick Douglass, but a lot of yes. these Right, yes. abolitionists and others on the posts like the, that we respect that we uh, uh, rightly so you know, greatly respect as ama amazing you know abolitionist social reformers sat at a spiritist table and believed yep. they can channel and hear from people that came before so i think yeah it, that 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 connection between espiritismo and mexico at least teresa's kind 
and, and what was had been happening in the United States, it makes perfect sense. And the place of women to have a voice, either as, as the Espiritistas understood it as like sort of just a, sort of a channeling, a pure channeling. Um, and that in some ways, right. you know, can kind of say, well, you know, women, especially young virginal women are perfect because they, for the, uh, uh, to channel spirits because they're young and, you know, um, and they can just let the spirit yeah, yeah. go through them. But I, so I think that's that's one way to have a voice. But I think also, right, that she knew exactly what she was saying, you know, and she was convicted in her beliefs and just so it's right. a mix of those things. Yeah. 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 Before we leave Teresita um, to talk about Ped, Pedrito, I don't want to uh, I want to give him some time at least. I want you to expand on this great quote in the book um, and the modern magic of the city had she lost the indigenous magic of the desert. Uh, and then you comment on her style of dress, maybe the way she did her hair. Um, was that really about assimilation? And did this assimilation affect her magic? And as you know, that's a great, thank you for that quote. Well, a couple of things about that quote. And I was just thinking about this quote actually. Um, so it, it, the inspiration kind of for that, or what I was even kind of responding to, I don't think I write it in there, is it's uh, Luis Urrea, the amazing novelist, Luis Urrea, who's written many wonderful novels, but of course, two about Teresa Urrea, and his second book about her life in, um, in, in you know, uh, in, the, in the United States, um, The Queen of America. Um, he has this part in it where she's, I think she's in New York or she's in one of these cities. And, um, and he describes how, you know, she had her hair swept up in an updo and like all those, you know, and the shirt waist and the long dress and all those trappings of modernity. And, uh, and then she kind of takes it all off and lets her hair down. And, you know, and sort of the idea is that she lets all the modernity go. And then she becomes herself the kind of Mexicana indigenous woman. Um, and, and, and so that was one of the things I was kind of hearkening to there, but also the arguments that scholars have made and not all of them. And so, um, but that the kind of, or the kind of not even just scholars, but the kind of narrative that has been said about her life so often is that once she crossed the border, um, she changed Well, she had babies, she got married, she had actually children out of quote unquote, you know, hold, you know, hold your nose wedlock, right? She was, she, so had she had she like just, had she betrayed, right? This kind of um, the, the dawn, had she betrayed who she was as the right, main Right, right, right. Um, and, 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 right and so, and, and that's so a lot of like, even in the, the famous book, Tadisita by William Curry Holden, who's an Anglo, right? But and so his narrative is very much, and it's, I, you read it in a lot of places, that something changed with her. Um, in meaning, often the meaning is she lost the magic. She lost that thing which is connected to the earth, which is connected to her place of origin. Um, and so, um, and so, and then, and then she's just not the same anymore. And so, part of for me, what I wanted to say was, well, uh, she, yeah. People change. People grow. She was eight, <laughs> 19 years old, so she she became a woman. She grew up and she lived in a world that she lived in, and so maybe she wore a shirt waist and wore these beautiful things that you know she conformed to what she saw around her. Um, but I mean, what I argue, she didn't lose that magic. She kept healing people. Um, but I think the narrative that's often said about her is that that. Or, or about, I think it just says a lot, I think about women, about, you know, um, Mexican or indigenous women, your power comes from, um, as much as your power might come from a particular place, you lose it if you don't stick within those confines of what the culture tells you, you should do. Right. That's you right. Know? And, That's I, right. I, and so, and I, you know, I don't want to obviously honoring Teresa, she never read, said anything about this that I found. So it's just my kind of interpretation. And mm -hmm. I really, so that's kind of where I was going from there. But you know, I got it. so that's kind of what I was thinking about is that kind of arguing a little bit against that narrative. And another scholar, Brandon Bain, um, who does, you, you may know re religious studies. I do. I did yeah, that, yeah. So he um he wrote this really great article about her years ago, and it was about her kind of healing tour that she takes through these cities. Um, mm -hmm. And so he very explicitly also kind of argues against, but also that idea that modernity and that it can't exist with other things, that it has to be either you're modern or you're you're American or you're Mexican or you're this or you're that. But that sure. um, so so that's sort of where I was going with that. Got um, it. Got it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, Don Pedrito Jaramillo, he works on the Texas borderlands, uh, and boy, they, these are tough chapters to read because there's just a lot of disease. 
there's yeah. a lot of incurable disease, right? I mean, you, you, yeah. what's really, really, I really like about this book a lot is you're really putting it in context, which every historian has taught we need to do, right? <laughs> um, that medicine is kind of primitive at this point. Yeah, there's no cures for these things, right? There's a yellow fever that, that comes every so often, particularly in hot tropical areas. It comes from the Caribbean. Uh, tuberculosis, which the, that I see that we'll die from, um, is rampant. I mean, my, uh, my uncle, who probably, my, my family's fruity, you know, they, they crossed over a long time ago, right at the beginning of the Mexican Revolution. And, um, you know, the fact that you would, you know, you'd had 12 kids, my great grandma had 12 kids. She was a good Oh, wow. Um, oh, yeah. And, but, you know, the fact that, you know, that you would have to, because there's no health care, mm -hmm. right? There are no doctors, there's no accessibility to any of this. So one of her, uh, one of her 12 kids dies. Right. Um, because infant mortality is probably ridiculous at that time. Um, tuberculosis. I think every one of my uncles had tuberculosis at one point. One of them, one of my uncles couldn't go into World War II. Uh, he signed up to go. He couldn't pass the physical because of his lung capacity had been damaged because of the disease. Um, and, it, you know, it marked him for his life because, you know, he really, really wanted to go, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and a couple of other uncles who I know and a couple of aunts, you know, it's just, it's, and they uh, traverse their way up the border to Texas and then to California. So it's like, this is where he's working. There's all kinds, there's drought, there's violence, there's hunger. It's amazing. It's a, it's a very dire circumstance that you, that you paint. I mean, how does he do it? What, who are his supporters? Where does he get his finances? Or is it just him? And like you said, in this little ranch, just doing it himself. I mean, what's his support structure like? Great question, Arlene. Thank you. And um, yeah, he, so I think one of the, in one of the stories I tell about him, and there's so many healing stories um, that have been shared, oral histories, like there's all these like little, you know, very sort of anecdotal stories that I trace, but, uh, but um, so one of the stories that I, I picked to focus on and to kind of dig into a little more and research was a story when um, Don Pedrito heals um, Doña Tomesita Canales, who is the mother of JT Canales, Jose Tomas Canales. Um, and so some listeners will probably know that name. He's a um, really, really significant figure in South Texas, Texas history broadly, Mexican-American history. He's one of the founders of LULAC. Um, he famously, um, he famously led a, uh, um, a sort of a lawsuit or a campaign against the Texas Rangers for their um, incredible violence against um, ethnic Mexicans in that region. And his own life was threatened when he did so. So he's a, he, so, so Jose Tomas Canales is this really important figure that I knew about. And so when I was reading all these healing stories, I was like, oh, Canales, Doña Tomasita Canales is that so, you know, and I, so find out the story is indeed it's JT Canales, his mother. And so the story is that she's sick. It's never said, you know, in any of the sources what she's sick with, but I kind of make a speculation and inform speculation that it might be yellow fever because there was an outbreak of yellow fever right in that area. Um, and there had been in uh, John McKiernan Gonzalez's work um, about yellow fever in that region kind of talks about this. And, but Anyway, he, so he heals her. So the story goes, um, she's very, very sick. She has a high fever. She's delirious. Um, she's so sick. She can't even recognize two of her sons. Um, and her husband, Don Andres Canales, doesn't believe in, so Don Pedrito is a thing already. They know about him, but, but, but not all you know, Tejanos and Mexicanos believe in him or whatever, right? Of course. So, so he's one that does know, he's a key and he has money. So the Canales family is a wealthy family, wealthy Tejano family, big landowners, you know, esteemed people um, in this region. And so he wants to take her to get, get the best doctors. So the story goes, there's two doctors he brings out, they assess her. And both of these doctors say, you know, there's no hope. She's just really sick. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing that can be done. And so, um, so Doña Tomasita's mother is there at the time with her, you know, and she says, we're going to go. She tells Don Andres, go get the curandero. And I love this story, right? She's like, throws down the authority. She's like, you're, and so they send for, so basically they send one of their, um, you know, they send one of their workers um, on the ranch to go to Don Pedrito to Los Olmos, which is probably a couple hours away by horse um, to get a receta or how Don Pedrito cures is typically with, 
writes out a little prescription or has someone working with him right out of the prescription, real quick analysis. He's known to just be able to diagnose very quickly. So this person comes to Don Pedrito, says, here's what's going on. Don Pedrito writes a receta. It has to do with her taking baths, like, you know, a couple nights in a row. There's a kind of a ritualistic quality to his cures. And mm -hmm. so by all accounts, Arlene, he, the, 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 the you know, the, the, uh, the quero comes back with the receta from Don Pedrito. Doña Tomesita does the cure, the bathing at night in cold water. Um, the doctors that are there, according to the story, say, this is crazy. She's going to die. She can't do this, but she does this and she lives. So, so it's a, one of Don Pedrito's kind of famous successful cures where he healed someone when, when, um, with one of these, who knows what it, if it was a yellow fever or something else, doctors couldn't heal her. They didn't know what it was because as you say, at this time, there were certainly just a lot of things People didn't, physicians didn't know. They didn't know any better than anyone else what to do. Um, so after this, it kind of, the story of, is kind of that Don Pedrito sort of became, um, or like the, the, the Canales family probably gifted him a large piece or a piece of land. And so having that kind of connection um, and, you know, and that's just, you know, that's probably to my knowledge, the most famous story of healing because oh, of okay. the, but I think so then the word spreads, right? Um, and you have this, this networked family that will send people and they'll send their vaqueros and they'll send people to him. So I think part of his support structure is like that kind of story I think says a lot. And later I talk about in a different chapter how um, when Don Pedrito is accused by the, the, the post office, local post office and the American Medical Association of fraud, that is uh, uh, because he would, take cures um, people would e email him letters and, and he would send a receipt in the mail so anyway there's a story that he's you know and at this time there's all kinds of truly fraudulent healers you know claiming to cure cancer if you give them money or whatever but but jt canales like today uh, very similar mm -hmm. like today right yeah exactly right <laughs> that hasn't I mean, changed i know it right that's so interesting <laughs> he hasn't i mean and also yeah yes um so he, so, so JT Canales, I mean, this is years later, defends um, Don Pedrito and gets him off the charges. And I, mean, I think it's that kind of, I think that's the support system. So I think that's, you know, well, that's the big, the big wig family that are obviously very powerful, but also just so many hundreds of cures. He's just, I mean, you know, he's just so known as a good person. And in fact, I had have had um, at Metro State here in Denver, a student from Jalisco, Mexico, um, a couple of semesters ago um, that she's lived in Denver for a while, but her family's from Jalisco and she goes back. And this is where Don Pedrito's from is Jalisco, Mexico. Um, and she said, uh, my students call me Dr. Jenny. She's like, Dr. Jenny, I know about him. She's like, in Jalisco, there's a shrine for him. And they call him good. There's a word, a Spanish word I can't remember. She says, we call him something in Spanish. And so she sent me these pictures. And so you hear the books are already published, but I'm like, oh yeah. my God. But just, so just to know that he just, he, he was a person that helped people. He had a gift of healing and he healed people. And so um, the word just spread and spread and spread. Mm -hmm. And often people would come yeah. to him as a last resort, you know, um, but then other people, it, there's a lot of last resort that physicians can't heal, or there's just not a physician there, or there's just right. something where the, phys, you know, sure. absolutely, you know, or people don't have money to see a doctor or have the money that the Canales family had to bring doctors in to get all the best diagnoses, you know? Um, yes. Yeah. I, I, I like, think for folks who've been studying healing over time, uh, whether it be good on that is small or, um, and in, in you know my case and others in Latin America among um, uh, Mexicano and Mexican populations here, it's just urgent, desperate need. Right. You know, I mean, crisis kind of spurs on the need for this. You know, because there is no, there's nothing else. There's just nothing else out there for them. Um, I am talking to Jennifer Shotka Seaman. Her fabulous book is called Borderlands Curanderos, The Worlds of Santa Teresa Urea and Don Pedrito Jaramillo. If you have a few more minutes, I want to just finish this up because it's so good. We could yes. go on forever, but I, I'm good. <laughs> cognizant of your time. All right. Um, the section on gender healing, you know, we haven't talked a lot about that. Get the book for those of you listening. That's how you do this. Get the book because it is really, really good. There's so, tons of stuff on gender and Teresita, but with Pedrito, Really interesting that the hot and cold cures, right? And 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 you have this great section about uh, the idea that uh, the restoration of masculinity and how that was gonna 
that, that maybe that was part of his success as well, right? That that men also mm-hmm. sought him. First of all, because he was male, right? Because mm-hmm. he was a man. Yes. But but t- talk to us about that, about those kind of. But I said this, right? How how did that work? That was yeah. So I had so much. That was such an interesting kind of line of inquiry to go with, and I was inspired to do that um, when I was reading um, David Montejano, um, his book about um, Mexicans in the in the making of Texas. I think it's called a, a really wonderful cl- classic book on um, great Texas. book. Yes, great book. Great, great book. And he has a section on. Um, well, he has a lot of great sections, and there are a lot of things that I, I were so informative to my work. But when he talks about the ways in which. Um, land loss happened in the South Texas region, you know, which goes back to you know Mexican American War post 1848. The US government promised um, the all these land grants that that Mexican people had um, come going back from Spanish land grants, some of them and Mexican ones would be protected and that the US court system would, you know, their land would be protected. But what David Montejano shows is how that land was slowly, slowly lost from a variety of ways. Um, and 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 so I could go on for about that for a while, but he, you know, a lot of it is out, out, outright theft and and just, you know, um, just taking, but a lot of it is through the court system where they make these families prove, try to prove that it's their land. And then to prove it, they have to pay all these court costs and they pay it with their land and all this kind of stuff. Right. And, um, but one of the things, the big argument he makes is that this kind of what happened was it made people that were many people that were once landowners into workers, landless workers into, you know, the proletariat. I think he says the proletariat, proletarianization um, of Mexicanos, and so and so the kind of then along with that, and also reading a little bit of, of Américo Paredes's work, the kind of loss of you know masculinity when your land is your is your thing that your family that, that what you own and it's your identity, and then you you know over time you lose it, and so all you have left then to sell is your labor to these Anglo ranchers, um, and so. So I just I, I I was really moved by his analysis, and then then kind of pairing that with, okay, well this is the region that that Don Pedrito is in. This is all this these this is it's happening at this time, and so many of the tear stories that that emerged in my research were, as you said, of men. I mean, some of women too, but most of them were men, and the kind of stories were often where he would um, give them something that was hot um, to take a hot or something to kind of heat them up. Um, and so then, so I'm just, you know, I'm just researching, writing down everything I notice and trying to make sense of it. And then I'm noticing with women like Doña Tomesita Canales, it's often something cold, cold baths out in the air. So, so kind of thinking about the gender theories that sort of swirling around at that time about men um, needed, you know, also just the kind of broad gender idea of at the turn of the century, men were getting too, um, what's the word, you know, quote unquote, civilized or emasculated, different what's maybe happening in Texas, but the idea that their manliness was being taken away. And so heating up that, you know, and so, so that's was kind of fun to think about in terms of the heat and the kinds of um, remedios or recetas he would give these men. Um, but I really, Arlene, those stories to me also were ways to really open up a story of one person and like look at like these these broader arguments that people like David Montejano makes. What does it look like in this guy's life, right? Who is um, lost his job or he's getting beat up by or like you know and here he comes. So I kind of wanted to use it to sort of open up that that context and that story in a, in a kind of intimate way. Um, so yeah, so it was it was an interesting thing to note just the kind of heat, you know, the kind of and then this kind of humoral you know, theory of, you know, the balance of humors and things that are still with sure, a lot sure. of healers. So, um, yeah, but definitely, yeah, yeah, but definitely yeah, absolutely. He, he did cures. He was definitely specific about hot and cold. So that's just very interesting just to yeah. note and, and to kind of do that gender analysis was a lot of fun. Um, right. I, um, every, I haven't done this in a while, but I'll go and I'll sit in a uh, botanica and I'll tell them who I am. And uh, not that that means anything, but that I'm a researcher, you know, that kind of puts them at ease. I'm not there to do anything other than to learn. And uh, I just keep track of who, you know, like a good historian, you know, like a good ethnographer, I'm just sitting, who comes in, what do they ask for? What do they want? And uh, it's overwhelmingly women. Yes. Um, Overwhelmingly women, Uh, health, money, and romance. You know, yeah. and uh, it's and he is a um, he's out here in Southern California. Uh, uh, he, it's mostly counseling, 
counseling and, uh, you know, psychic abilities, you know, to kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, fortune telling, but he does, he does not use objects. So no cards, no, nothing like that. He's just, it's a sense that he receives, but it's this thing of there's a, he's a male figure, right? An older gentleman from Mexico. Um, but, and, and he has this following, right? It's just like you said, it's just, it's a following. It's like a centrally located area. And then part of his, uh, his remedies for, for women is usually cold, cold baths cold showers, uh, oh, maybe a cold, cold compresses, something like could because the, their, their, their children are driving them crazy, you know, what a cold compress, you know? And so it's just, but, but I don't see enough men in there to make a comparison to say, do you, do you wow. give men like hot things? <laughs> you so know, I wish I did. I wish I, I would, I could sit there for, for, for much longer than I ever have and, and see, my guess is that there's just not a lot of men who go in there. Mm-hmm. Again, I think it's, I think it's, uh, you know, the standoffishness, you know, that I'm like, I don't need that. I don't, I don't want to go to that. That's for old Mexican women. Wait, <laughs> to, go I, to. <laughs> really um, to me about that, just really quickly too, is one of the things I didn't, I think about when I think about the stories that I've, or the healing stories that I've come across for mm-hmm. both Parisita and Don Pedrito. Um, and I'm, as I'm thinking about it now, Arlene, I think it's a larger percentage of stories of healing men, maybe less so with Teresita, but still with her. And one of the things I noticed with her was that it would be like, often they would talk about her healing like white men, like Anglos that were like prestigious. And I wonder, again, going back to our work as historians in the archive, maybe those are the stories that get recorded, got recorded for Don Pedrito more. Maybe it wasn't that he actually healed men more. It was just that because, you know, they're men, that their stories get recorded more I'm just kind of thinking out loud, but I, 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 I think I, I think that's pretty close. I don't think that I don't think that's a an uneducated guess at all. I think that's pretty yeah. close to what we find in archives. Period. Yes, <laughs> you absolutely. know, you know, I love the part where Jaramillo's curative powers are attributed to Aztec blood, <laughs> and I want to I want to wrap this into the, a discussion of of race because um, I find it fascinating, as I'm sure you do, that, that the paradox, this Met- Mexicanos, Mexicans, indigenous, they're dirty, they're disease carriers, they're, they don't contribute to the public good, they're just a sap on, the, on healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. But then this paradox of like, oh, but they have this great blood. They have this secret magic, right? It's like <laughs> ma- the, the magical Mexican, you know? It's like, <laughs> like they're, they're so awesome. You know, and it's like, well, which one is it, right? I mean, it can't. I mean, of course, we know historically it's both, right? right? Historically, it's whoever serves whatever need, and it's usually whatever political need, right? Mexicans are a drain, but yet they they are the engine that drives the economy of all of the borderlands. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but still, they're a drain. You know, as, as we know that, um, as political rhetoric for over a century. You know, but um, so the, it's attributed to his Aztec blood, which I loved. Did you find that common among other curanderos that it's the blood, it's their Mexicanness, it's their in, in their indigenousness? Because I want to mention, I don't know if you know this, but there was a Pentecostal healer, very famous in the borderlands, um, started in Mexico. He started Catholic. He became Methodist and became Pentecostal, turn of the century. And then was Francisco Olazaba. And he was called El Azteca, ah. right? The Aztec. And the magazine articles touting his uh, prowess at healing, obviously lots and lots and lots and lots about God and Jesus and the spirit. And boy, you Catholics better get in line and convert because look at this, look at what's happening. And he is, he travels around the country and, and in the Caribbean as a faith healer. He is famous, famous, famous. Um, but they also did talk about his Aztec blood, right? They also talk about his fiery Aztec blood, right? And there's always this thing about, you know, to go back to the hot and cold, the fire, right? There's fire. There's some, I mean, Pentecostals would never talk about it this way, but there's magic, right? There's something magical about his touch. There's something magical about his, his something that's coursing in his veins, right? Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts about that. I mean, when you looked at Cura, if you've looked at other curanderos 
or, or just to make a comparison to Pedrito, what's that about for you? Yeah, that's a great, I, I, I feel like I have come across the name El Azteca, but I just made a note here. I need to like research this person more because, well, what I found was that, um, so for both um, Teresa Urrea and Jaramillo, um, there's different places where um, their, their healing powers were attributed to their Aztec blood. And the, the whole trope was, or the kind of, you know, the, the, the angle of that was, it wasn't there, like it wasn't about live, indigenous people living now or from the regions that they were from, uh, right? Exactly, from, exactly. Uh, it's, from, it's from these ancient Quatemoc. It's from the ancient, right? Exactly. Right. It's, right. What is it? It's um, a romanticized past. Yes. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a romanticized, like, oh, look at the, and you know, it's like without any context to how those civilizations right. were destroyed. Exactly. By, by colonial powers, right? It's it's amazing. I interrupted. Please go ahead. But that's no. that's a great point. It is. It is. And it's I think it's something that I, um, you know, I, I, I forget. It was a, probably a conversation I had with um, my, my thesis of, or my, my dissertation advisor, Neil Foley, about mm-hmm. this kind of this idea of um, I think we were even talking a little bit about, you know, the Chicano movement. He was sharing with mm-hmm. me like his thoughts about that. But this idea of valorizing you know, one part of the past, of Mexican past, and the Mexica, the Aztecs, they're this mighty, mighty, mighty people. And that's useful for the Mexican nation state narrative to say, we're descended from these two great, great warrior, wonderful, you know, you know, the, the Spaniard, the conquistador, and, and the Mexica warriors. And so it's like, you know, this, this kind of selective use of the past. But what about all the other indigenous peoples uh, uh, across Mexico that were exactly right? Oh, and 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 in the time of of the healers, I'm looking at the the Yaqui Indians, um, the Mayo Indians, these people that te- the, the the Apache, the people that Tadecito was healing, and I know Don Pedrito as well. Um, so I think it's kind of this way to you know erase to you know to find this thing way in the past that you can celebrate it's way back here we don't want to talk about indigenous peoples now because at the turn of the century it's in the united states it's the quote unquote kill the indian save the man you know it's the the indian wars the, the wounded knee massacre it happens in 1890 but there's tons of other massacres and violence against people same in, in mexico against the yaqui so there's all this violence and denigration of indigenous people at that time the way that the mexican government writes about Teresita's Jaqui followers. But then we can say, though, amidst all that, the, the Aztecs and the Mexica were mighty. And so it has to be that. It has yeah, to be that. Of course. That point they're healing. And so I think it's really, it, it's, yeah, it's like this selective, it's the selective use that we do this in our na- national kind of narratives of history. And you can see it kind of placed it's, upon them as well. Um, yeah. 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 So, well, because yeah. they're, they, uh, they're deprived of writing their own, um, writing their own narrative, right? They, they have had to become subsumed by somebody else's narrative and it's usually the narrative of the conqueror. You right. know, it's not the narrative of the conquered, right? And that's an old trope, but it's, but it's so sadly, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't ever seem to end. <laughs> I know it, it doesn't and it's, it's yes. And I think, um, and I've, you know, one of the things um, I've, but that's been really great about working on this project is I've it, just this last, like I'd say a couple of months, two young women are, are graduate students who are working on a thesis that are um, touching on different things that my book touches on, but like taking it in different directions have reached out to me, like two young Latinas that are so smart and like they have these great questions and they're taking it forward. And it's been so great. I'm just like, it's so, it's just such a, it's been so exciting for me, but I think that conversation of like things we talk about, Teresa Urea especially, that she had to deal with that are, they have to deal with this kinds of the kinds of racism and the kinds of um, issues that you know we change is and then we don't change. Um, and um, so thinking well, about history, if history teaches us anything, right? That's <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I yeah. hate to I hate to end the podcast on such a down note, but we'll 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 we'll, we'll brighten it up a little bit. Uh, boy, thank you so much for this. This is Borderlands Good on Veros. The Worlds of Santa Teresa Urea and Don Pedrito Jaramillo by University of Texas Press and the author is Jennifer Koshatka Seman. Thank you so much. I mean, I tell you what, I know that you're committed to, to doing history, but if you ever want to try your, your luck at screenwriting, this may like solve all your problems, you know, screenwrite this thing. 
do a treatment because this this is one of these stories that I'm sure people are just this needs to be told on a broader spectrum in a more popular set and you know I wish people would read history I'm sure we all do I want everybody to go out and buy these books uh, that's why I do what I do that's why you do what you do but hey if you can see it on a screen and you can see it on one of these cable channels or whatever yeah. I mean this is such a good story her, we didn't even get to her marriage. We didn't even get to her kids and her divorce so much. It's such good stuff. And as long as it's not exploited, uh, there's just such good material here about her strength, about his strength uh, in the midst of some, just some dire, awful um, borderlands areas that were just filled with, with just a lot of violence and a lot of, of a, a complete and utter lack of the basics. You know, and I don't think we think about that often. Is that this, many of these popular, the most, the poorest of these populations had nothing. Right. You know, and it's like these are two people who sought to fill that vacuum when the state refused, or the state could not. And it's it's just amazing. And I'm I'm just so thankful that you put this out there for people to read. And it's been great talking to you. So if you have any last words other than that, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so much, Arlene. This has been a fabulous conversation. I, I hope we can talk again. Actually, there's a been lovely talking to you. And um, yes, thank you for having me. And um, I love your idea about a screenplay. I've actually thought about like a documentary or something because I know with my students too, it's like, oh, I know that I want them to see this story. Um, and I think the kind of, yeah, so I've, I've thought about that. Um, and, and it's keep, They're cheaper to make now. I mean, they're not cheap, but they are, you know, uh, I don't know how uh, Colorado is doing in terms of your Colorado Humanities Councils or anything. There's probably some seed money for that because this is, it's just made. It's so vibrant, right? It's so colorful. Th these two stories are made.